Hi, Sally. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, I know that you just trained this morning. What pool do you swim out of in Perth? And give us a rundown of the session that you just completed. <laughs> um, I train with my uncle, who actually is the head coach of Central Aquatic Swimming Club, and they train at Bayswater Waves. So I go down there and and swim three to four mornings a week. Um, it wasn't that bad this morning, about 4K. Um, and I went straight from there to the gym because, um, yeah, it's either take two kids to the gym with me or really quickly get it in before eight o'clock um, so that I can get home and take over from my husband who's bringing me a coffee. <laughs> That's good. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what did the session, what did you do in the session? that made up the 4k give us a bit um, of a walk, walk through the warm-up and the main set uh it was pretty light aerobic warm-up and then a little bit of breaststroke stuff at the moment we're doing probably a little bit more endurance um based uh sort of I think a lot of people had time off over Christmas I, I didn't because I only swim three times a week so it was nice to just go in and get some a break <laughs> um, uh yeah so the main set was um a little bit of breaststroke so some short rest sort of a bit more endurance based um and then at the at the back end of things I did a bit of speed work and then got out and headed to the gym yeah so it wasn't it wasn't too much like I don't do more than 4k now in a session um one I don't have the time and two I just don't have the capacity anymore to do you know five six seven k sessions like I used to when I was younger um and I get bored <laughs> <laughs> um yeah a lot of my stuff now sort of goes towards that sort of aerobic endurance and then just for a little bit and then usually just a lot of speed work yeah and do you mainly do most of your workouts being a, a breaststroker in your past life do you do most of it breaststroke or you mix up the strokes uh no a lot of it's free um I try and just do specific speed work breaststroke um and yeah I think it's really different from what I used to do um back when I was a teenager and definitely back through most of my career was really, really breaststroke orientated for everything. Um, I'm actually all right at freestyle, so that's okay. And, you know, it's hard to, to swim around a lane um, when you're doing breaststroke when lots of people are doing free. So I really just try and keep all my specific speed work for um, breaststroke now. Um, that way I'm not fatigued either. I'm not over, you know, overdoing things with breaststroke and um, yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah. And are you, are you someone who's more leg or um, dom dominant with your swimming? Um, I'm a bit of both. Um, okay. I worked really hard when I was an athlete to make sure I was both. So as a, as a junior, I was probably better kicker. Um, mm -hmm. a really, really good kicker. And my breaststroke pool was really bad. I was really good at free and fly pool. Um, but my breaststroke pool was, you know, a bit lackluster. Um, and I had to work really, really hard, um, for quite a few years. Um, when I was at the AIS, um, there was a girl there that was amazing at pool. And I used to be so jealous of, of how good she was. Tani White, she was incredible breaststroke pool swimmer and, you know, incredible sprint breaststroker in Australia. But I was just so jealous of what she could do. And I had to work really, really hard so that I could become a really good pool swimmer. And yeah, um, towards the end of my career, got really good at breaststroke pool as well. So I'm a bit, um, I'm quite even now. And I think that's important. Yeah, I find that so interesting because people are often very dominant one or the other. And it's really refreshing to hear that you're sort of yeah equal in both, but that you worked really hard to get there. Did yeah. that sort of entail a lot of um pool with the pool boy or was it with a band or was it with drag suit how did you work on that um a lot of it was um just pool boy work mm -hmm. um and a lot of breaststroke pool so I was oh at the AIS I'm trying to think of what year it was probably about um 2007 and 8 and 9 and I just did it was like a lot of like I do a 200 medley and then a 200 breaststroke pool then 200 medley then 200 breaststroke pool and I didn't get any extra rest. It's either you make the cycle or you don't. And then it was like we do 1650s breaststroke pool and every second one was fast. So you just had to get better at it. Um, and I, like I said, I was strong in freestyle pool. So I did have a strong upper body and I knew that I was good at pool. It was just trying to find it in breaststroke. I just had never had or done breaststroke arms training. I was always leg dominant. So yeah. Um, it was a lot of hard work and um, <laughs> even now I get really tired arms, but I think that, you know, it works, it works well. Like, especially when you're trying to do a bit more speed work, like I am now, like I said, don't have, don't have the pleasure of getting in more training to do anything other than a 50 or maybe a, I say a hundred, but really I make it to 75 meters and <laughs> I'm hold, hold on. <laughs> I love it. It's what I say now, I just go out and like, hold on. Um, so yeah, it helps with that because I know that I've got both my legs and my arms there, but it took a lot of work. 
Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. You're a dual Olympian, world championship um, and Commonwealth Games medalist. And for all intents and purposes, you retired from the pool. So share with us now as a mother and a businesswoman, you find yourself back training at 38 and winning medals at the Western Australian State Champs. How did that all come about? Um, uh, yeah, I... I loved being a swimmer and I loved that part of my life. Um, and when I finished swimming, I actually became a coach um, and was getting up earlier. Why would you do that to yourself? But anyway, <laughs> I was getting up earlier as a coach and then I became a mum and I absolutely love being a mum. I've got three boys. So one just turned one. I've got a three-year-old or three-and-a-half-year-old and one that just turned six. So a um, bit of a handful. Uh, but I think it was end of August, um, you know, my husband always used to say, why don't you get up in the morning and go for a swim? Because, you know, swimming starts at 5.30 in the morning. So you can go, it's fine. Like go two mornings awake or do whatever, you know, just get out and do some swimming. And I'm like, no, I don't want to swim anymore. I don't want to swim. And I was really adamant that I didn't want to do that. Um, and then I, I think I got to, yeah, the end of August and we sort of sat down and I was like, I'm really struggling. Like, I don't, I don't have anything for me anymore. I feel like I'm really overwhelmed with all of this stuff to do with my kids, like making sure they get to everywhere. And, you know, we started our own business as well as, as husband and wife. So it's another whole nother story and he runs it. Um, so it, it's sort of, you know, there's a lot that we're taking on in the past sort of 12 months and I wasn't getting any time for me and I wasn't doing anything, no matter how much, you know, we try and give each other time, you know, three kids in a business and life take up a lot. Um, and I just sort of sat down and was like, oh, I'm struggling. And I work for a mental health organization, so health charity. So I should, I should know <laughs> when I'm like, this is happening. But I was just getting a bit angry and upset all the time and just not holding it together. And and I said, maybe I should, you know, and my husband was like, again, why don't you go back swimming? And I was like, I can't go back swimming without a goal. I, I need a goal because I'm not one of those people who can just get up in the morning after being woken up five times during the night from sick kids or a baby not sleeping and go for a swim. I'll be like, no, the sleep is way more important. Like the extra half an hour that I'm going to get. Um, and so he's like, well, why don't you set yourself a goal then? Like if, if this is what it's going to take. So I did, I set myself that goal of um, going to state championships. All right. I said, all right, well, if I'm going to do this, um, like I want to go to states. So let, let me see if I can qualify and swim at the West Australian state championships, which is in December, which gave me four months. Um, and so I started off pretty simple, just getting up and going swimming three times a week and trying to make it to the end of the session, you know, every day without dying. Um, then I started adding, adding in gym and my husband used to laugh because he was like, why don't you get a gym membership? And I was like, no, I'm not getting a gym. I'm not that serious. It's just a goal. Um, <laughs> and so I take my baby down to the park where they have the gym equipment and I let my two, the three-year-old run around at the park and then I'd hold my baby and like do sit-ups and squats because <laughs> he was like eight kilos. So I was like, I don't need a gym. I've got, I've got that down the road. And I'd, I'd meet some other mums there and we'd have a chat and, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't serious. And then, you know, I started entering some country competitions and some different competitions and, and racing. And um, yeah, it was just a whole nother outlook on swimming again for me like getting back into racing again I was like oh my god how am I going to go what's this going to be like and yeah it's just a whole yeah for me it was starting to do something for me to help my mental health and to help my sort of everyday well-being and you know we have found that that's picked up I'm really happy after I go for a swim in the morning so um and my kids get up at five anyway so it's like see you babe <laughs> <laughs> um, leave it leave it to him for three mornings a week um which is like yeah I can't can't thank him enough for, for all the support that he's giving me but it's been lots of fun and how far do you see this new journey going now like what what what's you you've done the champs in December what's next on the horizon um oh, I, I was talking to Andrew about this because we had to as, as a family, we have to really sit down and organize our life. But I said to Andrew, what if I go to nationals? Like if I could set myself a goal of qualifying, like I think I've qualified for nationals, sorry. So like going and competing again. And one of the things about, for me, starting competing again, um, it was never about, I want to see if I can make an Australian team. I want to see if I can, you know, if I can win. Um, as much as those things would be amazing and that, you know, winning a medal at States was great. Um, for me, it was like, I want my kids to see me race. Like I want, I want them to know that that picture on the wall of mummy that they walk past every day and don't give a crap about of me, you know, swimming breaststroke at the Olympics. You know, they never ask about it. They will, they will talk about any other photo that's on my wall, but they'll never ask. They don't know that mummy was really a swimmer. So 
um, I said to Andrew, that's the one thing that I want to do. I want my kids to see me swim and see that, you know, mummy gets up and pushes herself really hard and, and, you know, still looks after you and still does all the other things during the day. And um, this is what can you, you can do if you, if you dedicate yourself to something. So um, yeah, it was that, that was be that's been my goal originally. And so now, um, you know, if I, I'm hoping to go to nationals, which is June, <laughs> yeah, I think it's June. Um, it's June, isn't it? June, yes. June. June, yeah. yeah. So I have set myself a goal of doing that. But um now I just want to keep doing sort of races and getting my kids down because the first time I raced that they saw me race properly, um, was at um I mean at HBF Stadium. Um, it was just a qualifying meet, I think, or a carnival. And my kids, Andrew brought the boys down to watch me swim late in the afternoon. And they watched two of my races. And as soon as I'd finished my first race, my three-year-old's like down the stairs, pushing past the officials, trying to get on the blocks. Um, and my five-year-old <laughs> in the stands, taking his clothes off, like getting his bathers on. Come on, daddy. Um, not understanding that the competition's still running. So, and that was the greatest thing ever. It was so good to finish that meet. And these boys came on pool deck and, you know, lucky for me, I've been around a long time, right? So all the officials, <laughs> I know they're my kids. You know, they get in lane four and they dive in and they start swimming, you know, my five-year-old starts swimming laps. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, mommy, you got to race me. Um, you know, and that's just so good. Whether they become swimmers or not in the future, but that's, you know, one of the things that really inspires me now. I think it's like seeing them really excited to watch mommy race and see that what I can do. Um, you know, I'm not just, you know, their everyday mommy. I can do other yeah. things. You've got other things on your, yeah, absolutely. I think you're setting a great role model for your for your children. And I think that's the way that they then learn and, and model that for their own life. So yeah. let's hope that we get some future hunter boys swimming for the Australian <laughs> team. Yeah. <laughs> We've got um, Alicia Coates is, a, you know, we're, we were roomies through two Olympics and, um, you know, we stay in contact all the time. We catch up when, you know, we caught up for the first time in five years, a few months back and, um you know, we were saying that between us, we've got six boys, so surely we'll have a real agent. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How old will they be in 2032? Oh, they won't be old enough. Uh, they won't be old enough, will they? No, no. like is it 10 years from now. So my six, well, 16? No, 16, I don't think you do. It's, it's getting harder. I mean, like back in the days when I was swimming, 16-year-olds made the Olympic team, but it's getting older and older. I know, I just... Now, isn't and, it? And I think that's the thing too in swimming in Australia. Like one of the things that I try and tell a lot of kids that I see is like, don't, don't, you know, don't need to be that champion at 16. It's not, it's not about that. There's, you know, those Olympic medals are, you know, one in the twenties now in the mid cycle. Exactly. Like depending on your event, it's even later. Like it's like the, you know, some of those freestyle events, those boys are like in yeah. their fifties now winning medals and, and, and the girls too, like we're getting more and more girls in their late twenties starting to drift. Yes. And it, that's, just so awesome for the sport like and yeah, again I just like you seeing kids or seeing girls and boys at 14 15 16 and then retiring at 18 yeah <laughs> yes. like yeah that's exactly and that's what people did back in in sort of when I was swimming when I was a teenager like at 18 or 19 if you hadn't made the Australian team that's that's it you're out there's yeah. nothing for you there was no step forward I love the way the Swimming Australia put in those um extra age groups at open nationals where they have the sort of 18 to 19 and was it 20 to 21 as an extra sort of like yeah. a extra competition and motivation for those kids who just miss out on that team so they've still got something to aim for so it just might keep yeah. them in the sport that little bit longer so that they might make the next team yeah exactly and I I think they're doing a really good job with that and I, mm -hmm. I actually think that they could do more in that space because so many kids like we're not the only sport in Australia that has a massive drop-off rate of athlete you know for, mm -hmm. you know, sport from what is it the age you know like 16 17 like there's a massive drop-off rate in all sports in Australia and you know you don't want that to happen if we can just keep those kids just around so then they can go to nationals get make it a little bit easier and get them comp competing in uh, you know like at, like interstate and then give them more opportunities. For me, like there's only, you know, 40, 45 spots on an Australian team every year. And usually those spots, you know, like a lot of the time there's repeat swimmers. There's not someone who usually comes in and goes. Like it's usually a repeat thing for swimmers now, which is awesome. But it means that there's, you know, we've got 100,000 members in our sport, um, <laughs> you know, Australia-wide. 
and only 45 of them make an Australian team. So it's like, okay, well, what else can we offer? For me, I think there's so much more that they could offer. There's so many things internationally that we could do. Um, I guess it's all just about funding and money, but there's so many opportunities internationally to go race now. Um, there's got to be a way to get these guys to go, hey, look, you know, like, okay, if you don't make the Australian team, we can still, you can still go and compete in France. You can still go and compete in Europe. You can still go and do these World Cups. It's just about how we can, I guess, fund them to get there. Um, you know, it's it, it's hard, but yeah, that. but for me, if you didn't make an Australian team, but you got to go travel around Europe and compete and make friends, that you know, how awesome would that be? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That would have been great. <laughs> yeah. There were years that I didn't make the Australian team. And one of the things that kept me alive was going away internationally and competing and catching up with people that I knew and, and just that still having that really high intensity racing, mm-hmm. um, but just not at the world level, not at the world championships. I just didn't have the label around it. Um, and I loved that. That was, that kept me going for those couple of years there when I missed the team. <laughs> Yeah, that that's heartbreaking when that happens. Which, which team did you miss? Was it two hundred four? Uh so oh, actually two thousand and four. I, well, I don't know if I expect. I didn't. I was, that was my first Olympic trials. So right. um, I dropped seven and a half seconds that year to make. Wow. To make the qualifying. <laughs> um, and then I dropped another like three and a half seconds to get second fastest women in Australia going into that trials. And I had like, I was never been to a trial. So for me, it was this massive eye opener. Um, so I don't think I was expecting, I would have thought like my dream was always to go Olympic, to go to an Olympics, but I never thought that I'd go at, in 2004. Um, yeah, it was my, my <laughs> it was lots of fun. Um, I completely, you know, I say crap my pants like I got so nervous I wasn't used to anything um but it was for me that gave me that opportunity of what do I actually want to do now this is what it takes to go to Olympic Games like yes. what do I want to do and it made me make some really hard choices in the next sort of 12 months of my life so um yeah but the teams that I missed were uh 2015 so I missed Worlds in 2015 and then um so I had so from 2014 to 2016, when I didn't make Worlds in 2015, I did a lot of international racing anyway. So I went overseas and 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 competed um, and loved it. And so I had something else to race for. I, I was, you know, and that's what I needed at that end of my career. And then 2016 missed um, the Olympic team and um, ended up retiring after that. I didn't retire straight away. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually say I never want to make it. I never wanted to make an emotional decision um, around to me because obviously when you miss a team, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on um, like mentally for you. So I said, no, I'll keep swimming. And obviously I had Kyle um, who'd made the Olympic team who I trained with and I had, um, and so I had a couple of boys that had made the Olympic team and I really just wanted to keep training for them as well. I wanted to to be there because I was always the mum. <laughs> I just wanted to be there for them and support them. So I kept training and then it got to a couple of days before they were about to go to USA. So I kept training for another couple of, about three months. And they were about to go over to the US to do some competition. And um, I pulled coach aside and said, yeah, look, I'm not going to be here. I'm done. When but, you get back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't. I can't do it anymore. And um, I was really emotional, but um, I sort of said, like, I'm just not happy and I'm coming in because I want to be there for those boys, um, like Josh and Kyle, but but I'm done. So, yeah, that's un- that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the positive side of things, you did make your Olympic debut in Beijing and then returned in London in um, 2012. Take us through the emotions and those races that you raced in over there, 200 breaststroke, I believe. You made the final in 2012. Talk us yeah. Through um, so I, I guess I'll start with 2008. So obviously that was my aim, my goal, my major goal. From when I was 13, I set a goal of I wanted to go to Olympic Games um, after reading my aunt's diary. Um, and so I was like, no, I'm going to go to Olympic Games. And that was my chance, 2008. I knew it. I was, you know, pretty, I was in the top two and three in Australia in terms of breaststroke. And I really, that was it. So um, I was quite confident in that competition. And when I made the Olympic team, I was, you know, emotions can't describe it. It had been a dream come true for, for a decade. Like I was 13 and I was 23 when I made my first Olympic team. And um, it was just, you can't really describe it. I, I still think back and I get like the goosebumps of, you know, walking into the village for the first time and getting your uniform given to you and 
just going into dining hall and, and for me as well again walking into the water cube walking into the pool in um fishing was just you know just took your breath away there was just this incredible venue and you just knowing that you were going to be there feeling peaks you couldn't you couldn't stop the nerves from like hitting you and all of the excitement and everything like all that emotion hitting you when you walked into that pool for the first time and um I was pretty confident like I really thought that I could do something good at the Olympic Games um whether or not I believed I could win a medal, I don't I don't think I did. Um, not really. I just really wanted to have an opportunity to be there. And so I swam a really good heat swim. So in Beijing, they had they swapped the timetable around. So it was the first That's Olympics right. that they did the finals in the morning and the heats at night time. So we'd been training for that. And, you know, we weren't trying to get too caught up in it. It was we knew what we had to do. So we went and I swam the heat in the evening. And I saw my PB and I was really, really happy. I was like, I felt really good. Um, so the next, and then I had to go back to the village, have a sleep. Um, and I just remember that after that heat swim, I felt really confident. I was like, that was so easy. It felt really amazing. Like, I'm really excited to swim in the semifinal. Um, but I had to go home and get yourself to sleep. So it was not like you have a day you can walk around. It's like you got to get yourself like at least five hours sleep here. So I don't think I really slept. Um, not really, oh, no. <laughs> got up, got up. I did what I could, I uh, got up the next day and we did out, went for a walk and went for a, like a little bit of a paddle in the, um, the pool that was at the village. Um, and then we, you know, get ourselves ready. Then we go in for the, for the finals session. Um, so I went in and I remember warming up and feeling really good again and, um, went and swam that semi-final. And I think it was a little bit slower in the semi than I was in my um with my heat swim. So I was that little bit slower. And uh so I stood sort of on pool deck, like watching and watching and watching. Um and the event before me was the women's hunter free, actually. So um not the exact event, but you know, one of the events before me. And Libby Trickett had missed the final by one spot. So I remember seeing her miss that Olympic final and she was like a favorite to win a medal. And then um, you know, I did my swim and um the same thing happened. So I got night. So oh. I got night and I've seen her get night. And so I was just like absolutely devastated. And she was, you know, in the in the team area and she was the same. Like I just, you know, I and so for me I was like trying to hold in all of this emotion of I can't how could I get night? Like I'm not gonna be in that final. I just so, you know, I went through my motions, coach came over, we did our debrief. I was like, all right, now get in and swim down sail. Like you need to, you need to, you know, we still need to come back. You're still a reserve. So we're still going to warm you up. You're still going to have to go through the process of pretend, you know, you never know what can happen at Olympic Games. Someone can miss a bus, some, any, you know, like someone can get stuck somewhere. You don't know. So we're going to prepare yourself. Like you have to swim in that final, whether you get that birth or not, it's going to happen. So I did my swim down and got my massage and everything. And as I was swimming down, um, they did an announcement over the PA system. And one of the girls in that Hunter Free final had got DQ'd. So Libby had been put in. Right. And I remember like the whole Australian team is just losing that, like going, this is amazing. Like she's going to be in and then Shannon not winning a medal. And so for me, I was swimming and stopping every hundred meters. And I'm like, Shannon, please tell me something got disqualified. Like, can I just, I just want that too. I just, I just want to hear that someone in the turn of show got DQ'd. Um, not an Australian, obviously, Lisa was in there. <laughs> but like in my mind, I was like, come on, look at for me too. Um, it didn't. I went about my emotions and obviously went and warmed up the next day and it was like, Sal, you're not going to, they're not going to need you. Don't worry about suiting up everyone's. And so I was like, okay. And um, had a lot of tears and was talking to my family a lot. And I was actually Jim Fowley, who used to coach in Australia, John Fowley's dad. Um, and he used to do a lot of stuff with the parents of the Olympic swimmers and stuff. And he said, we do this thing with the parents of the Olympic swimmers. Instead of picking an athlete, every night who's going to win each race and we put like $2 on it or something to make it fun because then people could bet against their own kids or against their own country like they do it for the whole of the world. They said, we pick a time. So why don't you pick a time of what's going to win the women's turn of breaststroke? And I said, all right. And so I was like, I reckon 2.21 um, because Liesl was in it. So I really was hoping, you know, she could win it. And I just went and sat in the final sat in the crowd cheering on the Australian team and cheering on Liesl in that 200 breaststroke final um, in tears, just watching it, like absolutely heartbroken. Just all I wanted to do was be in that race. Oh, um, 
So it was such a long journey to because it was such a long journey like to get there and to be sitting and watching the race go by when you, all you want to do is be in it. So I was just in absolute tears and um, Rebecca Sunny ended up winning that race, thinking a world record and Lisa got second. And I was just like, in in my heart, I just wanted to be in there. Like I just figured, I just was like, if I'm in there, I've got a chance. So although I was absolutely devastated, I think the fire was reborn on that night for me to go to another Olympics. Like I, my dream was to go to one. So if I ever got a second, it was going to be, you know, incredible. Um, but that was where it was born because I never wanted to sit there and feel like that again. I never wanted to be sitting in a stands at an Olympics watching the final of the race that I want to be in be swum. Like I wanted to give myself a chance, even if it's in lane eight, like it doesn't matter. Like in the final, you've got a chance. You've got the same chance as every other lane. Like, yeah. um, So I think that's, yeah, that's just where it was reborn. So the devastation, there was reborn of this new fire of I know what I want to do now and I want to go again and I don't want to be in this position again. So um, yeah, went home and started training for four more years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and four years later, did a, you know, did made a second Olympics, which is, you know, super, super exciting. Didn't have the best trials, actually. Had a horrific Olympic trials, but made the team in the 200 breaststroke. Wow. Um, ended up, you know, doing a good time in the heat, good time in the, the like PB and the semi this time. And so got eighth into the final. So I went into, went, went in black. That was my, when I saw my name come up eighth in the top eight and be in that final, that was it. That was it for me. I think I was just like, oh my God, I've done it. Like, this is my goal. It was, I just did it. So I didn't have the best final swim. Um, I think I just didn't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I was overwhelmed with all of that. I've made my goal of going to Olympics. I probably should have aimed higher. You know, I, you know, for me, I was really goal. I probably should have aimed to try and win a medal. I was on fire in training for the past six months. Like I should have had it. Yes. That. but um you know the relief of being in that final and just the opportunity to walk out on pool deck and have my name pulled out and wave to the crowd um you know I think back now it happened so fast like you know from when you walk out to when you swim like there's only a few minutes gone and it was just it, you know I feel I look back now and I think I wish I'd enjoyed that moment so much more than I did like I think that I was like in the moment but I just I didn't absorb it as much as I should have, I think, now that I look back. So, you know, I had a good final swim. It wasn't my best swim. It was a bit slower than my semi. Um, finished eighth at the Olympic Games and, you know, walked away from that really not knowing what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot about myself. And like I said, I wished I'd enjoyed that moment just that little bit more, just tried to absorb everything. I think, you know, you're trying so much to do everything to get yourself ready to race that you don't really let yourself sort of absorb what's going on and uh, that's one of the things now when I race is um I, I just try and enjoy the fact that I get to stand up and race it's not the for me now there is no pressure like and I think that's the thing too is like learning racing again now is it's been so different and so much more fun <laughs> to learn <laughs> yes. yeah well the pressure the pressure's off yeah yeah, yeah. and um you know, towards the end of my career, I really questioned everything about my race. Like, did I get a good start? Like, you know, like you, you try and break down those every single little one percenters to try and get better. And one of the things about that is that then just you just add more and more pressure. And, and for part of it, I think as well, um, for me that I, I've definitely found out since starting back racing is I always wondered if, um, you know, my nerves were actually nerves. Like, were they the good energy that you need or was that anxiety driven? Was right. that driven? You know, was that, it's not actually nerves. That's just like, it's a different feeling that your body gives, right? And it's not until you're older, or me, for me especially, that I was like, now that I stand up and race, I'm like, oh, I actually don't think what I was feeling those last few years of my career was nerves. I think it was like I was putting so much pressure on myself that I was feeling anxious and getting that anxiety and and yeah there probably were nerves mixed in but there was just so much going on inside my head to get everything right that I didn't probably get the best out of myself ultimately because I let that all overcome myself and now I race so much freer I just you know I feel nervous and I know it's gonna hurt and I just go I just go get in and go like you know what like it's okay and and I think it's just such a different feeling now so it's as well, that that's the great part about it. I said to Andrew, I don't know how I'm going to feel when I go back racing. 
because I didn't really enjoy racing as an athlete ultimately towards the end of my career. I didn't really enjoy it because of how stressed I was about it all, I think. And now I just get in and go, see what I can do and have fun. And um, yeah, I really don't, I don't have that pressure anymore. So it's good. That's so nice. It's like you've rediscovered the joy of swimming. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's good that it's happened now, but you like, I always think back and I'm like, damn it. Like, oh I know. <laughs> yes. Well, with, with hindsight <laughs> and what, you know, I mean, you know how they say youth is always wasted. <laughs> yeah. <when you're> young. <laughs> and that's very true. You know? Yeah. You, um, can't... <laughs> you can't go back. Can you like, can't go um, back. but you know, like one of the best things about this all too is, is for me racing now is just the bonus of like yeah. I get to race like I'm so happy that I get to train three times a week and sometimes four times a week in the pool um you know and I get to bring my kids into the pool like I might swim three mornings a week but they get to come to the pool with me in the afternoons and have a play and do swimming <laughs> <laughs> with I say swimming because they see that it's my family like my auntie and my uncle and my mum coaching them and they're like <laughs> they do whatever they want they, get back they just get away with murder there and then we go play for like half an hour so um you know to be back on pool deck and around my family again and be part of this amazing community at the club is is really really cool and to bring my boys up in that you know to see them like bolt through the front doors of the swimming pool like a massive swimming complex and like hightail it for their for my aunties and uncles which they call auntie and uncle like hightail it to go see their family and like um I posted a video of my three-year-old he saw me his first club night the other few oh weeks how ago. gorgeous <laughs> so cute before Christmas and like just having all these bigger kids you know the teenagers that I say bigger like 13 year olds um <laughs> you know, sitting in the stands and like getting my sons to sit with them and playing games with them and, and sharing popcorn with them and you know that's that's what I love about it now is like there's this massive community of people and it's, you know, there's just so much that you can get out of swimming. I think it's not just about that competition side of things and, and yeah. getting the best out of yourself, like this community and these people that support you and around you and help your family. Um, yeah. I think, you know, you can't get better than that. <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. And, I mean, you come from such a strong family background of swimming. As you mentioned before, your aunt, Evelyn, it was Evelyn De Lacey was yeah. her maiden name. She went to the Berlin Olympics in 1936. And you mentioned you read her diary. What did she have to say in that? What did you learn from that that you took into your swimming? Um, a, a lot. She Her story is really incredible, really. Um, yeah. And there's a lot that's in that's not in the diary. Um, so I was given her diary when I was about 12, 13-ish and um, said, you know, read this and go away and think of what you of what you want to do in swimming um because my my sister was older than me and she didn't really want to take swimming that seriously she she loved open water swimming and she had these she was actually a much better breaststroker than me um I don't know how I got good at breaststroke I was a butterfly but she you know she didn't want to do it and so I was given this diary it was a hand typed like typewriter like wow of a diary and I sat down and I read it and I'd heard stories about her so my my granddad was this incredible storyteller who would always get up you know, every Sunday night at dinner, we would sit there as kids and sit around him and he'd tell stories about, you know, him and one of his 13 siblings. So he was one of 14 kids and she was one of his wow. <laughs> family, right? Like, yeah. um, and, you know, we'd heard his stories about how tough she was and how she wouldn't take shit from anybody. And sorry, I should say, um, okay. you know, but yeah, and back back we're talking about the forties and the fifties, like at a and a young mm. woman and she she was a big woman and she did not care. Like if someone was doing something wrong, she made sure that she stepped in to tell them they were doing something wrong. So if she saw someone bullying someone in the playground, she was there to step in. Um and I I really, you know, sort of was drawn to the fact that she was this really strong, you know, sister of his that wouldn't take any crap. And I got to meet her later on, but um, yeah, read this diary and just thought, wow, like this is really cool. If she can do it, you know, why can't I? She she spent four weeks on a boat wow. you know, swimming in like a, a three metre by three metre canvas seawater pool and someone had to hold her feet so she could do arms and then hold her hand, you know, and then she'd hold the edge and kick her legs and they would only get that, you know, one hour a day because it was, a you know, had to do the whole of the, the, the liner, the, everybody on that cruise ship. So, you know, just what wow. she went through to train to go to Olympics. And then, you know, she talked about walking in the opening ceremony and, and seeing Hitler and, 
Wow. Um, also the fact that she was a woman. So she wasn't actually in the Olympic Village. There was a separate area for the women's oh, history. They didn't stay really? in the, Yeah, oh. like allowed in the Olympic Village. Um, but just also hearing and finding out about how hard it was for her to go later on, um, I think that kind of inspired me to go, oh, if I know that I've met, you know, I've heard about this woman, I've met her, I, you know, I want to go to Olympics. She had so much harder than I have it. Like, why can't I do it? Um, I think that was it. Like she just sort of, she was the, the, the moment of inspiration that made me want to go. Um, you know, like I said, she, she was um, one of, she was the, one of the fastest women in the world for her events. She was faster than the men in Australia, but the men were picked on the Australian team to go to Olympics over her. So they, there was a big protest in WA and for another girl, I think in New South Wales, um, the selectors didn't pick these two girls who were top two in the world in events. Um, and they picked men over them, which, you know, they were talking about okay. 1936. So yeah, it's going to happen. Um, and I just was thinking like, how cool is it that a whole state rallied behind her to protest her selected? And they basically said, yeah, sure. She can go, but you got to find the money to pay for her to go. We're not paying for her to go. Oh. So the family fundraised and did everything they could until at the last minute, I think it was like the Daily Mail, the Daily Newspaper over here, basically Gates said, we'll give her the £150 to get on the boat. And that was 24 hours before the boat was leaving Perth. Wow. So she got on the boat and they took a baby, Joey, a kangaroo, over to Berlin with them, um, with Percy Oliver. So yeah, like her story, I think as well, the more research that I've done as I've gotten older and found out more and more about her, just, you know, no wonder she was so powerful to me. Oh, yes. She was powerful to me as a kid, but then, you know, and I heard that the family had to pay for her to go. Um, yeah, just just thought it was incredible that, you know, this, this, she became, overcame so many odds. And unfortunately, she went to the Olympic Games um, where it was um, a little bit different. It wasn't like the top eight make the final at 1936 it was you know like um like a staggered thing so top two 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 you know so the top two or three from each heat make it through the final um and she was I think third in her heat but the third fastest time overall oh, and the, time no. she, the time that she'd swum would have I think meddled in the final so it was just one of those unlucky situations where that mm -hmm. happened and it, it happened I think in two events for her so the time oh. she before. so um you know but for me yeah. Just having that just inspired me and, and hearing the stories from my granddad about her um, and then later on meeting her was really, really awesome. And I still stay in contact with her family now, which is, you know, they live in uh, they live in Sydney and, you know, she used to still up until just before she passed away, go down to the baths, um, to the Bronte baths and, and go for a swim. Um, I think they ended up giving her a key <laughs> at stage because she complained that they weren't open early enough. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Um, I hear some of it. She's a she's a pretty um uh a pretty stubborn woman, but a very forthright woman. So you wouldn't you wouldn't go against her. And if she asked for something, it wasn't worth arguing. I think I got that idea of like if she was like, no, like how come, you know, like and she also complained because there's no women's change rooms at the baths. So they gave her also another key to the pump room because she complained that she had nowhere to get change. And she was here before anybody else. So she needed a key. So, and for me, it's just like, how cool is that? This woman's amazing. <laughs> what a trailblazer. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, she's just probably born in the wrong era, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's that's really hard. Yeah. I, I'm glad they changed that um, two in each heat. I mean, they still do it in the athletic, track and field in the athletics. Yeah. Two from each heat go through. So yeah. it, it, it's not fair because if you've got a faster time, you should be in that final. Yeah, and I, and that was the thing. I, it took me a while to do. I did a little bit of research on that because I was like, why didn't she make the final? Like, mm. and you know, doing a bit of research, I was like, oh, it was like it was like athletics swimming was basically mm. top two, 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 two. You make it through. So, um, and that's just how it was. And yeah, like you said, I, like athletics have their own way about things, but I'm glad that they changed it for swimming because they do. Like, <laughs> imagine <laughs> top two, and you know, there's some people who are sixth in a heat and they make the final. Like, yeah exactly yeah oh. you, you never know no. and it should it should be the fastest eight people there it shouldn't yeah. be shouldn't be like a a lottery system as to what heat you get into yeah and, and I think through. and I think that's the thing right like it should you should know that when you're in that top a mm. the best of the best that's it like yeah. you've you've that's done nice. the time to get there for us I think that's why our sport in a way 
you know, is probably a little bit less, un, you know, it's a, it's a uncomplicated. Like if yep. you're in the final, you earn your spot there. Like exactly. whether, you know, and sometimes it means that maybe you miss, like I did, you know, like sometimes you miss, you don't get it. But if you're there, you know that that's your spot. You've earned that, you've earned that right to be there. Um, You know, it's cutthroat and it sucks sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, that's the rule. So it's, yeah. Yeah, it's. It I love that. the fact that it's it's objective. No one can argue that you've earned your spot there. It's not like getting picked for a basketball team when there, you know, there might be someone more talented out there, but someone knows someone or you know whatever. Yeah. When it's subjective like that, it makes it so much harder. But I love the fact that swimming is just on time, so you <laughs> earn your spot, and the, yeah. And I love fall. <laughs> there's no, there's no variables either in no. like everybody's trying to get me to swim to rock nest at the moment. Like everyone's like, come on, like, <laughs> what are you doing to rock nest next year? And no, I really don't want to swim 20k. I did, I did it when I was 13 with some friends, and um, you know, that was me done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, uh, for me, pool swimming, it's like you have your own lane. The pool is exactly the same that everyone else is swimming to. You're stuck in your own lane, like same temperature, no matter what pool you go to for competition. Like you're safe, yeah. Like it's all of this stuff is like, okay, I've got my little box and I'm happy with this box. Like I'm going to stay here. Like whereas I think open water and triathlons and team sports, there's so many variables. I'm like, okay. <laughs> if my kids get into team sports, I'll be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, it's tough, <laughs> tough to watch. <laughs> Well, you can always um, put yourself on the on the um, the Masters World Championships. You know, there's lots of world records there to break. Yeah, I've heard. Like, I actually didn't even because because I've been looking at pool swimming in WA for oh. Masters, and at the moment we're in the open water season in Western Australia, so there's yeah. not much going on in the pool in terms of Masters stuff. Because I was like, oh, I could grab a few more competitions and see. Yeah. Like, and, and then someone told me today because I was like, oh, worlds would be later. You know, like, do they do something? I didn't know if they did worlds this year. And then mm. someone told me today, actually. Yes. <laughs> like, well. well they were pushed back because of COVID. So they did they did a sort of a makeup one, which was just yep. Japan. And they've yeah, got yeah. A, they're backing up again with Doha in February. But there'd be Singapore the following year. And then it's back to every second year. Okay. Yeah, because I was someone when someone said I was like, no, I swear it was in Japan, because I saw Susie swimming. Yeah. Um, you know, and I you know, the whole of Australia watched that because that's right. Cool. Um, <laughs> but you know, like and I had a lot of friends when I when I quit swimming in in Adelaide or when I was stepped out and retired and became a coach, um, the master swimming community really sort of brought me into their fold. Yeah. And um, I remember being pregnant and racing, like 25 metre freestyles. Like this club was like, we'll pay for you to come down and like be a member. And if you just, could, could you enter this competition? I was like, yeah, okay, I guess. Like, you know, we'd do 25 and 50s and that was it. And um. You know, it was, yeah, I love that. I loved how chilled it was. I was, you know, going to this competition expecting like, oh, my God, what, it, what you know, how serious is this going to be? And like, don't be me wrong, it's serious. But in the same token, it was so cool that I could push a pram onto pool deck with a, yeah. you know, eight-month-old baby, you know, and people would sit around and play with my kid and I could swim 25 metres and then I'd get out and I'd time keep with my baby beside me, you know, like I just <laughs> thought, how cool is this? And then they all go to the pub after and I thought, this is just so cool. Like, again, I completely different community but just you know, like you know you've gone from for me with you know was was an elite swimming and there, there's a great community around that and then master swimming which just had this cool family again another family vibe like people sort of bring you in and I think when you step out of the sport for me as well like my job was to try and get those people that kind of missed as a sort of ambassador for master swimming in Adelaide and that was a really cool thing. There were a lot of swimmers that were like 18, 19 that were trying to going, oh, I want to quit. And it's like, oh, have you thought of Masters me? You can just come and have fun and enter a 25 metre race and break a record and just do whatever you want to do. And just, you know, it's not, you don't have to do specific training if you don't want to, but, you know, they do do training sessions and it's lots of fun. They go for coffee after and it's, you know, it's not as intense if you don't want it to be, um, you know, and I think there's so many great things that Masters Swimming does. So, um, yeah they brought me into their folds and I loved it and yeah to get sort of back I don't know if I'll go to Wales we'll see I haven't actually when I found out what it was today I was like oh I need to chat to Andrew <laughs> <laughs> um because um yeah I didn't even think about it I just thought that I should have looked it up really <laughs> yeah I mean I think we've got Masters Nationals in Darwin in May next yeah, year yeah I, I looked up that yeah I did look up Masters Nationals in Darwin um because I've been talking to Wayne about about that and I've been talking to my auntie too because she's back in Simi and I said oh you could go and do the open water she's like where is that I said Darwin she's no no way 
that water. Oh, there's crocodiles in that water. There's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> It's like surely they're not going to hold it where there's crocs, right? But I guess you don't have. Well, it's I, I'm sure it's at that little foreshore thing, and I have seen a photo, and it's got a half sort of barrier, but the other half is not a barrier. So I think they can swim in there. There's no way I'll do that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. <gasps> the, the pool, yes. Yeah, the pool. <laughs> yeah, the pool is really cool. Like, yeah. I love, I, I love Darwin. So yeah. <laughs> I was all up there in a heartbeat. I'm like, <laughs> um, my brother used to live out there for, for a while so but then yeah I wouldn't yeah like I said I don't like open water anyway there's just too many there's too many things happening that I can't see <laughs> yeah it is kind of scary I just spent a week at the beach actually and I had I took a little video and I didn't realize but there was something dark on the bottom of the pool and someone said what is that when I've looked back <gasps> at it now it was seaweed but I'm oh. always conscious of <laughs> seeing anything that goes underneath and you know if the, the water's murky you can't see so you don't know what's there so it's kind oh, of scary <laughs> oh, I've got friends that go and they love it like and they're like oh I just feel so free and I'm like yeah what if you see like but the shadows that freak me out and they're like no nah, you just switch off and swim and if it's you know if you're meant to be eaten by a shark then it's, <gasps> you know and I'm like what <laughs> no <laughs> um, but there's but there, I, I get it like there are some people that just you know that ocean is their place so yeah yeah cool. absolutely so, yeah, yeah. The ocean is theirs. but yeah I would be like you was that would well, touch me <laughs> I know <laughs> during over. during COVID we swam a lot down in um, Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne and um, there was because the boats were not allowed to or no one was allowed to go on their boats there was just an influx of wildlife which was lovely. One morning we saw a pod of dolphins, but the on the other hand, there was a lot of stingray and there was heaps of jellyfish, like not life threatening, but huge, huge jellyfish that actually, <laughs> like they smash into you and they, they give you a real thud and their little stingers <laughs> go across your face. But it wasn't pleasant, not yeah. pleasant. But I guess you got to take swimming where you can. Like the pools were, the pools were closed, so you had to do what you had to do. <laughs> but getting back to your swimming. One of your huge achievements was the silver medal that you won at the 2014 Commonwealth Games in the 200 breaststroke. Can you yeah. talk us through that race and tell us what that meant to you? Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember the race now. Um, I think that race is, it was just so much fun. I was getting to the end of my career. I knew that it was sort of coming and I actually had given myself the goal to go to Commonwealth Games. I hadn't decided to go on to 2016 yet. Um, and I really, so, and I had a, a great year the year before and, you know, a good year that year. So I swam the 50 earlier on and then the, then the 200 was coming up and, um, I just knew that I'd been training really well and, and I, it was, I was rooming with my best friend, like Alicia and, um, I just didn't really have anything to lose. I think at that competition and I, and I, I felt really good. My family came over to watch me too. So, um, my mum and dad were there and my husband came over, um, it was quite funny because he had to fly out. He had to go to Paris for work um, the day of my 200. So he came and watched the heats. Oh, no. My dad came and watched me. And then my cousin was there too, my cousin Hayley. She lives down the road. Um, and, you know, it was just so cool. It was just, it, it felt, it didn't really feel like a major competition to me. It was this smaller pool, really close-knit crowd around you, um, and it was just you know, the Commonwealth Games is, is like a mini Olympics for us, it's just, but it's, I feel like it's a little bit more laid back. So it's probably a little bit more my style, a little bit less stress. And I just remember getting up and going and swimming uh, like pretty comfortable heat and I felt really good. Um, and then getting up in that final and I was like, no, nah, this is it, I want to win. And it's probably the most confident I've been going into a competition and especially a race. And um, I just remember standing on those blocks and going, yeah, I want, I want to win this. So um, I swam an amazing race and um you know just got pipped out by, by Taylor McEwen at the time Taylor McKean and um Kaylee's his bigger sister and she was this little ripe 18 year old swimmer um but you know what when I hit the wall and I because I always did this thing at the end of my career the last few years of my career I, was, I hit the wall and I wouldn't look at the time that I did I just assess how that felt and so I hit the wall and I was like that felt really good and that was all I could do like I've got nothing left I you know I, that was the best race I could put together today and then I turned around and saw that there was a two next to my name and you know I think three lanes over um 
Taylor was there and she was like screaming like because she just won a Commonwealth Games medal and so you know I went over and I grabbed her arm and I lifted up I was like congratulations you know it's the best person won on the day but for me I was just so ecstatic too because I'd done that PB um and I'd gotten a Commonwealth Games medal and it taken me you know how many years eight years <laughs> being an Australian team to get individual silver medal um in a long course competition so um just that moment of of getting out the pool and seeing my family and you know I think my husband was in the toilets in Paris in a restaurant <laughs> <laughs> on the phone to my family like trying to just supposed to be at a work meeting um you know tr- you know so excited that he could you know it was I'm sad that he missed it but it was it was awesome that he could have been there in the morning and he just gave me so much confidence sort of get you know being there and just he was like you're going to be amazing and he's always been like that. So yeah, I think it was, it was really special and I was really, really happy. Um, got to swim the hundred as well. I really wanted to medal in the hundred, that competition, but um, didn't quite come to fruition, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, I think that was my, probably one of my favorite races, that one in the, um, I think the year before at trials when I won the hundred breaststroke um, out of kind of nowhere for me. <laughs> it was <laughs> exciting too. Yeah. And, and you had a, a relay at those Commonwealth Games as well. Yeah. So I, um, I sent the heat in the relay. So I'd actually, I've, uh, which I've done a lot um, in my career, there was plenty of, I've got so many heat like medals in my cabinet that are heat swimming medals. And um, I probably never used to take any credit for them because I was like, Oh, I didn't stand on the podium. I didn't win a medal. Um, but I really love now how swimming Australia has embraced those heat swimmers. I feel like it's yes. done a lot more now than when I was an athlete, we were yep. sort of giving our medal off behind closed doors on the last day of swimming competition when they had them, you know, it wasn't really that big of a fuss made about it. Um, as I started to get through my career and like I said, probably leading into being on that leadership group was, um, mm. you know, making sure that every member of that team feels like they're special because they are, <laughs> they are yeah. there and members of that team, whether they swim the heat, swim of a relay or, or not, or, you know, or in the final that, you know, like that team could have made the final and you don't know if we could have won that medal if okay. you take those away. So, yeah. um, you know, for me, it was cool to win that gold medal and get that space for that girls. But um, we, and we were having a bit of a joke before it because who, who we, I think it was Leif. I'm trying to think of who the heat swimmers were now because I'm pretty sure there were four different uh, oh. final swimmers because we just had so much depth and um then and it was really really amazing. So I had like Bronte <laughs> and Leish. And I'm trying to think who did the backstroke. It's <laughs> my brain not working. <laughs> uh, but it was just heaps of fun. Um, you know, that's relays are just always fun, just relaxed fun, and you swim so fast for your friends. So you, you like, I, I just. Yeah, for me, I would have done all of my races and relays and probably would have come away amazingly, but, um, you know, could always step up for those girls. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And obviously that sort of feeling that you have about um, that time in the team led you to be on the leadership team of the Australian Dolphins. What was that experience like and what what did you do in that role? Um, It was kind of a big decision to get on that leadership team. I think in 2012 we had, you know, a fair bit of things not go right mm-hmm. um the team there was a lot of stuff that shouldn't have happened that happened and and I still think today I look back and I think you know things still weren't handled well after that competition and I know a lot of girls that were in bad bad spots but for me I think the following year when I did make the team and I you know I'd moved coaches so I'd moved from I'd moved from Canberra and I I followed um, my husband to Adelaide and I moved started training with um, Peter Bishop and it was just a whole new outlook on my career like he was so positive and happy and relaxed and um, you know cared about me holistically so that I found like I found my place when I moved to Vish and and he was like you know you're such a good leader within the squad why wouldn't you go to be on that leadership group why you know when you make when I made the Australian team he was like you know they're nominating why don't you nominate and um, I'd never seen myself that way. Like I loved being like the mum of the squad and this, you know, being helping people, kids out and, and mentoring and stuff like that. But I'd never thought of, oh, I'll be on the leadership group. Um, so, yeah, I went for it and I got I got selected um, by my peers and it was a really massive rebuilding um, of our team. Like we had some massive, massive cultural issues rung deep in our team and, the team that took over that that leadership group that year, um, we had a lot of work to do, and um, we did heaps and <laughs> heaps and heaps of work. We had so many meetings, we had so many development days, we had 
so many things like learnings for us, like flying into a state for a day to do a whole, you know, workshop to figure out what we wanted as a team and then trying to relay that to Swimming Australia and trying to get everything that we wanted. And I think it wasn't probably until after I left. So that was 2012 and I was on the leadership group all the way up until um, they went to the Olympics. So even though I didn't make the Olympic team, I still, and it was just really hard. Um, I still oh. called in every leadership meeting. Yeah, because even though I wasn't on that team, it was still my job to make sure everyone on that team was getting the right support and the right help. We were doing the right thing by all of the athletes. So, um, and I think that was the really cool part about it, that even though I wasn't there, they were still sort of, yeah, we value your knowledge. We value, we still value you as a person and what you can do. So um, it was a big process from 2012, after 2012 to, to rebuild it. And I think I look back now and I, I think, oh my God, what did I do? But I don't know how hard it was. But um, it was also heaps of fun because we wanted change. Um yeah. and we we wanted to drive it ourselves and we did. And now look at the Australian team like they're, they're oh, absolutely no. flying. And for me as well, when I didn't make that team in 2016 and I had Kyle and, and Josh go on it, I felt I felt good. Like I felt like, yeah, these guys are safe. Like as the rookies on the team, they'll be protected. They'll be looked after. Like there's an amazing culture there now that's building and that they can help be a part of and they can help grow. Um, whereas before it didn't feel like you could do that. Yeah. Um, but I think that, yeah, I loved being, it was tough. And there were days that it was really tough, but I, I loved it. And for me, it was, I guess, a bit of a second nature. I'm not very good at standing up in front of people and telling people what to do, but I'm good at being part of the team and trying to encourage people to step up. Yeah. Well, whatever you did back then certainly got the ball rolling because they're they're flying now and the culture yeah. amongst the team is is awesome from what you see from the outside. Yeah, and I think that's a really cool part. I think um especially what we know is happening sort of within the sport itself, like to just see how strong that team is yeah. on a standalone um is amazing. Um, you know, and those those simmers on that team, like I I was a really small part of the thing. Like I was a part of six swimmers that were on a leadership group um, that worked really hard, but there were heaps and heaps of other people. Like it takes belief of a whole, of a whole yeah. group, just, you know, six people driving it. It was, it wasn't, we never wanted it just to be us. We wanted <laughs> the whole team to believe in what we stood for and, um, you know, seeing them now, like I've, and hearing the stories and stuff, it sounds like it's really good. So. Yeah, it does. It does. They all look really close. I mean, Aside from the fact that Queensland has pretty much taken in every single swimmer in Australia, except for Peter Bishop's squad, <laughs> we, we have nothing really left in Melbourne. Yeah, not isn't really. it so interesting now to me? It used to be that you would not leave your state and you yeah. wouldn't go anywhere. And I feel like when I moved in 2012, probably it was probably around 2016 you started to see, like, people were actually starting to follow coaches. Yes. So, and I, I find that really cool. It was about like, you know, it used to be you stay in your state, you know, if your coach leaves, doesn't matter, you'll find someone else, that kind of thing. And then you did get the occasional person that might follow somebody. But now I feel like, um, you know, like if, you, if you're if you a good coach, which uh, like people are going to follow you. And, I, you know, it ebbs and flows. Like Queensland have it at the moment, but, you know, South Australia doing good. I'm sure, you know, yeah. WA picked up on it. And I think that's the thing too is like, you can have hubs, but eventually people will go where their heart is. So yeah. um, for me, you know, I was lucky I had that support in South Australia. I went from, AI, you know, here in Perth to AIS to South Australia and three completely different community, com completely different environments. Um, but, yeah, I yeah, I don't know. I'd love yeah. to see. Yes. Well, I mean, look, it's working at the moment. I'm sure, as you say, things turn around yeah. in their own sort of natural way. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, like, uh, yeah. like, and if it doesn't, you know, we're doing amazing things anyway in the pool. We so, um, yeah. we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Now, I wanted to just, I know we've been talking for a while and I do, I know that I need to let you go, but I just wanted to quickly talk about your book, Born to, Born to Swim. Tell us how that came about, how you wrote that and um, and what it's about. Um, so it was pretty much about my great aunt Evelyn. So like I said, she went to the 1936 Olympics and wrote that diary. And I wrote a diary sort of, uh, you know, side by side with her. So like when I would read her diary and then I'd write my diary for leading into the 2012 Olympics, I should have done it in Beijing. Um, but you know, like I, there was so much going on and I was young and I was yeah. like, 
God. Um, I wasn't really <laughs> prepared. So to have the opportunity to actually write my own diary and sort of position it next to hers to see the difference and in, in what can happen in, you know, how, what is it, 80 something years or 76 years? Yeah. Years. Yes. That was really, yeah, really cool. And, you know, what she went through as an athlete to get to the Olympic Games was just incredible. But then what I went through is is a completely different side of it. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and talking about how I felt when I raced. So for me, I felt like that was the hard part. I never really, I wish I could could have interviewed her and said, hey, look, can I interview you about feels to how it felt to race? Because it was more like, you know, hers is very structured more like I swam didn't make the final but like it, there wasn't too much emotion in it and yes. I would love to have gone back and found out that I um, was very serious um but for me I feel like there's more emotion in mine and comparing what I went through to what she went through um yeah and then moving on after that so it's just our diaries sort of side by side hers is at the front and mine is afterwards and just sort of seeing what we both went through as athletes at completely different times in Olympic Games yeah that's amazing and where can anyone that's listening that wants to um search that out where can they get it um oh maybe just google I think (laughs) I think I've seen it online still um yeah, because there's a few years ago now, 2014, I do have copies, so you can always reach out and I can just post you a signed copy uh, because I still have copies in a drawer that I take around when I do talks and stuff. Um, yeah, probably just have a bit of a Google or reach out to me. Um, I think yeah, my website's got my email, so. so yeah, well, people can do that. <laughs> we, we can put your um, website in the show notes. So if people, um, you know, would like to read the book because it sounds really interesting, they can um, contact you there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like passes of pages. So. <laughs> so everyone that comes on the podcast, I always ask them to finish off our um, talk, deep dive five snapshot questions about your swimming career. So can you tell us, this is the first thing that pops into your head, favourite pool that you've ever swum in? Oh, the same. Um, <laughs> the Beijing pool. Yes, the water cube. Favorite. Yeah, the water cube. Beautiful. What about your favourite breaststroke drill? Oh, um, I didn't learn this one until I was older. Um, and it, who taught me it? I think it was an American girl taught me it, actually. And it's like two breaststroke strokes fully underwater, so like proper breaststroke strokes to get your timing, and then, you know, one stroke on top, then two full breaststrokes underwater, and then one on top. So a bit of hypoxic, but also like really good for timing. And you can do it as just 25 breaststroke underwater and then come up and do 25 on top as well. Um, just depends how good your lungs are. <laughs> oh, nice. What What do you do with your legs? A bit of a dolphin kick, or do you? No, do no, the same. Kick? So full breaststroke, stroke, breaststroke, stroke. stroke. Yeah, yeah. So it really teaches you about your timing because if your timing's out, um, you know, you'll notice it straight away. So it's you know because of the pressure of the water and everything, you probably can't oh. do the you know, lift up of your chest, but it's more like getting that hand movement in your legs. You can really sort out timing. So I like nice. And what's your favorite go to dry land strength exercise? Ah. Oh. We did so many. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I love any sort of Pilates core work. So like I love like the one where you stand on your, your hands and your, I don't even know the name of it. This is how bad I have. Um, your hands and your knees and you lift up one arm and one leg and sort of. Oh, yes. It's, yeah, it's not dead. It's the opposite of dead bug. It's. um. Yeah, yeah. Opposite of dead bug where you're standing. Yeah. 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 Um, I yeah, really love that one. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> Which is on core. Make sure everything's balanced. Yes. Yeah. And I've seen people do that on those big fit balls as well, which is a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what about your favourite current training set? Oh, any sort of speed work where I get rest? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do we do a lot of, um, well, Wayne does a lot of 25, so he'll give me like 16 25s and he'll be like, you can go three easy, one fast. Um, and I really love that. Like, even though I don't get super amount of rest, it's like full speed and I'll have to race the younger kid. <laughs> <laughs> so any sort of speed rate. I, um, you know, I'm good at endurance work, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I love just any sort of 25 speed work now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and aside from your very famous aunt, which other swimmer do you most admire? Can be past or present? um I'm gonna <laughs> can I give you two of course so when I was a swimmer, like probably Shane Gould like looking up to her like and what she did as a youngster was absolutely incredible um yes. and then 
And I, I don't say this lightly, like, and then now it's, it, when I was a swimmer, it was my best friend, Leash. So Alicia Crute. So, you know, she won five Olympic medals at the 2012 yes. Olympic Games. She was Australia's most successful, equally Australia's most successful Olympian um, in 2012 and didn't get anywhere near the credit that I believe that she should have got for it. I her. agree. Yes. Um, you know, because before Emma, there was her. And I just think like what that girl could do. And I, you know, I used to train not with her. She was in a different squad, but I knew what she went through and I knew how she trained and um, I wouldn't mess her, mess with her for anything. Like that girl on a, on a starting block was like full on badass. Um, <laughs> you couldn't beat it. Um but yeah, just her because I feel like I knew what she went through being her roommate and the Olympic Games to win those five Olympic medals. I know how much sleep she didn't get. I knew her regime. I knew, you know, like no help, no help. Like, you know, when people take bicarb and beetroot juice and beta alanine and all this stuff to help, she was all natural, like nothing. Yes. Like she would have, you know, like a Red Bull, half a Red Bull can or something. That was her, that was her go-to thing. Like she didn't do physio. She didn't do massage. Like it was, Leisha was super tough and very old school. Like I loved, I love her. Um, but yeah, I feel like she was just such an amazing athlete and such an yeah. amazing friend for being, to be in Olympic Games. Like I say, because we were roomies that, you know, we won five medals between us. <laughs> you did. Your, your room won five medals. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, she was definitely, yeah. in my, as we got older in my career, like I look back now and I think, I was yeah. so freaking lucky to have you. Like, yeah. you knew me and what you did was incredible. Um, yeah, because, absolutely yeah. incredible. And she's really underrated. Yeah. Oh, sure. so underrated. And if you met her today, mm-hmm. like, she's, and she, you wouldn't even know that she's won five Olympic medals, like got three kids. Like, Amazing. Yeah, she's just, yeah. She's, <laughs> oh, so I love her. Um, <laughs> nice. I like that answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sally, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been a delight speaking with you and I can see how joyful you are about being back in swimming. So that's so lovely. And um, yeah, best wishes for heading into nationals next year. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm really happy that none of my kids came in and interrupted. <laughs> I'm amazed. Like, my husband, I can hear him out there, and like Bob's asleep in the next room. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and take over, so he can go to work. Of course, of course. I'm sorry I kept you so long. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for having me. It's been, yeah, really good to to talk about it, and yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>